Are you crazy? My husband asked me. It was not a rhetorical question. I'm not going down that hill, he said, leaving me standing at the top of the trail, the same trail I always take every single day with the puppies, who for their part had cheerfully abandoned me, choosing instead to follow him. Now the way Chris had chosen was an easier way up the mountain, much less steep, and because we hadn't walked that way recently, the snow still had some traction. Unlike my trail, which had slick, icy footprints in it from daily use, with the constant melting and refreezing of my tracks, my trail had become hazardous. I watched Chris easily make his way down a different way, and I thought, well darn, why didn't I think of that? For weeks I'd been using my breakneck trail out of habit. It's hard to break our habits, even when they are clearly not working for us especially when we've been doing something so long that we've stopped questioning whether there might be a better way. But what blessings we might be missing if we never try anything new. That is one of the first lessons Jesus taught his disciples, according to Luke, who starts the fifth chapter of his gospel with this story. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Genesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. How about that? A carpenter gives fishing advice to a professional fisherman and nails it. The irony, of course, is that Simon Peter had been fishing all of his life. He knew a thing or two about catching fish. And he knew that sometimes you just have a bad night. That's when you dock the boat, wash out the nets, and rest up for the next try. And that is probably what he was on track to do until Jesus hopped into his boat and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Turns out, Jesus wanted to preach to the crowd of people standing on the shore, and he wanted to preach from a boat. After his near-death experience preaching to the mutinous crowd in Nazareth, I can't blame him for wanting a bit of a buffer between himself and the crowd. So he tells Simon to row, and tired or not, Simon obeys. You see, he owes Jesus a favor after the healing of his mother-in-law from a bad fever. He is prepared to do whatever Jesus tells him, and surely a little boat ride isn't asking too much. So they sit out there in the boat for a while, and Jesus preaches to the crowd listening from the shore. But once you get to the amen, things turn a little strange. Inexplicably, Jesus decides he wants to go fishing way out in the deep water, and at this hour, the best time for fishing is long past. And if they caught nothing last night, why would they catch anything now? Simon is exhausted. His nets are all washed and put away. Seriously? You can only imagine what was going through Simon Peter's mind. Was Jesus crazy? Was this a joke? a test of their friendship, or a whim, a novel experience to amuse a guy who worked with wood for a living. I wonder if the fisherman discreetly rolled his bleary eyes or grumbled a little under his breath. 
before turning to Jesus to answer, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. And by the way, I do this for a living, so I'm pretty sure it's a terrible idea, but you'll see. What happens is amazing. You heard the story, enough fish to bust the nets and nearly sink two boats. How on earth? What have they been missing out on all this time? Simon seems to be ashamed of himself, maybe for doubting Jesus. He says, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. But Jesus isn't taking no for an answer. Simon Peter has been shanghaied into the mission field, claimed by Jesus to assist him in the teaching, which will yield something far more important than a mess of fish. His mission is nothing less than the transformation of the world by showing everyone a new way of thinking and doing. From all their old expectations of life, Simon and James and John walk away, having been given permission to try things a new way. This story is most often used to challenge churches to reimagine ministry, to try new things, to reach new people in new places. The story has inspired congregations to open up food pantries, host community dinners, to offer things like after-school tutoring and evening parenting class. It's a great story for churches to hear. Sometimes we need permission to try something new and see where it takes us. Maybe hearing the story today will inspire you to act upon an idea you've had. It's how every great ministry gets its start. You might think, or someone else might say, we've never done it that way before, or we tried that once and it didn't work. That's okay. Simon essentially said the same thing to Jesus. But then because it was Jesus, he added, yet if you say so. Because this isn't Simon says. It's Jesus says, and what Jesus says is get out there and try things a new way. That's how we turned a few ordinary fishermen into disciples. As disciples of Jesus ourselves, we are called to be innovative, to get out of our ruts and to try new ways of reaching people. And I do hope that we will remember this and let it shape our faith life together, for that is the point of our life together. But discipleship goes even deeper than what we do together as the body of Christ. Being a disciple also shapes our own very personal lives, the way we live all the hours and days that we are not sitting in a church or actively participating in something called ministry. For as disciples of Jesus, we are invited to hear his call as permission to try new things in our own lives, to get out of the ruts in which we find ourselves, to create new paths that are less treacherous for us and for others who walk with us in life. You know what I'm talking about, right? I'm not a counselor, but I'm often privileged to hear people speak about their lives, and I usually notice themes in people's stories. This thing that has happened has happened before. It probably happens a lot, and it seems that it's just destined to keep on happening. But does it have to? Is there another way? What if instead of doing the same things over and over again, we imagine Jesus telling us, try something different? I know there will be excuses. Believe me, I use them every time I hear Jesus giving me instructions. Like Simon Peter, I usually start with reluctance. You know, I've been working on this for a long time already and just don't think your idea is gonna work. Then maybe grudgingly, I move to resignation yet if you say so, but ultimately what a relief to be given permission to get out of a pattern that I know isn't serving me well. What is something that is not flourishing in your life? Maybe it's a professional stuck place like Simon Peter experienced, or a challenging relationship that you just can't seem to get right. Could be a spiritual practice you've been trying to cultivate with poor results, or Maybe it has to do with how you handle things in general, your own ability to cope with the disappointments served up in life. Whatever it is, have you considered trying it a new way? This little fishing story can serve as a reminder that we have God's permission to try things a new way. We can parent differently than we were parented. We can learn to become less reactive when people irritate us. 
We can stop defining people by the worst thing they've ever done. We can turn off that channel in our brains that replays every mistake we've ever made. We can start to forgive ourselves and others. It's difficult at first, right? Our inclination is to do the thing we know, to take the path we've always taken, putting our feet into the exact same footsteps we've already made. But if that trail has become harmful for us or for others, we've got to make a new one. How do we make a new path? by walking it one new step at a time, one good intention at a time, one deep breath at a time, one withheld comment at a time, one kinder word at a time. It takes time and effort and grace with ourselves. I know it's hard, I build trails. It's easier to take the old ones, but not always safer. Sometimes you need to forge a new path to follow Jesus, to try out his way. We'll leave something behind, but what we gain is a nut full of blessings, too many to count. I leave you today with this fishing 